You ever, you ever wonder how you can reach more and more people around you? See, I mean, I grew up, and, and when it comes to neighbors, how many have awkward neighbors? Go ahead, you can wave at me and go on. How many have neighbors who are like, oh my goodness, do I really live next door to this? Hello. <laughs> I mean, it's exciting sometimes. You know? When I was growing up, man, we had some interesting neighbors. We had some neighbors that I was like, wow. But then, I mean, you haven't lived until you're like in the third grade and your parents send you across the street to borrow a roll of TP. Hello? Ever been there? Come on, there, somebody's in a moment going, woo! And then you run out, and you're like, what do you do? You go to your neighbor's house if you have a relationship with them. Back in the day, man, we would like go over for sugar and we would go over for flour. Sometimes it was eggs. Every once in a while, it was a little bit of milk. Mom was baking something. You didn't really run to the grocery store. You really didn't do those things. Sometimes you just went next door because why? Because they were your neighbor. You know, when it comes to neighbors, this, this whole series, I just pray. Here's my prayer. Is that we would get out of our, our comfort zone that we would step into that awkward place and we would choose to love as Jesus loved, that we would choose to see our neighbors in a different light and that, that we would be, be challenged today. My, my goal today is to make you so stinking uncomfortable that you get awkward. I'm just gonna tell you up front, my goal is to push you so much by scripture and realize that, guess what? I am made to be a neighbor. I'm not just floating through, through the universe. I'm not just a speck of dust. Guess what? God's got a plan for me. Jesus lives in me. I love him, and he's going to use me to change my world, and that's who my neighbor is. I'm going to see God use me. How many want to see God use you? So you're like, come on, Pastor. What are you saying? You know, I, I had a neighbor one time when I lived in Lakeland, and, uh, and he lived across the street, and he was from Connecticut. He had a family, had, had two teenage daughters. One of them, I think one of them was a teenager, one of them was, a, was in elementary school. You know those kids that bring those, those things from school, and they're like, will you buy this? Will you buy this? You're like, like, they're always like at your door, hey, can you buy donuts? Hey, can you buy some candles or, or something? Done? Some school's doing a fundraiser for something somehow, and some kid shows up at your door, and they're wanting to buy it, and you're like trying to be the neighbor, and, and you're like, oh, we bought that stuff from those girls, you know, and then they, they bring it over. You, why? Because they're our neighbor. I always think like, like, how can I reach those people? You know, they kind of know what I do. And, and, but, but how do I just be a simple neighbor to reach them? And then I realized one day that opportunity sometimes is inconvenient, is uncomfortable, and a lot of times it's awkward. But this guy, I walked, I, I walked out of my house. I was on my way to a meeting, and it was an, it was an evening meeting, and, and I was like, I had just enough time to get there. You ever have that where, like, you're walking out the front of your house, and you're on a mission, and you're moving in, in that direction to the car, and you're going to get in the car, and regardless what it is, you drive down the street, and when you drive down the street, you don't even think if you close the garage door or not, because you're going somewhere. You've got to be somewhere. You want to be on time somewhere. I'm one of those people, I like being early. That means I'm on time. I'm late, I'm frustrated, I'm stressed. I'm one of those people like, like I can't handle that side of it. But, but I remember walking out my door, having just enough time and seeing my neighbor, I hadn't seen him in a couple weeks and he had a walker. He had a walker and he was walking and something inside of me said, oh snap. I can just get in the car and wave and get going down the street because I got to be somewhere. Something inside of me said I needed to take this opportunity to just walk across the street, to cross the street and engage my neighbor in a different way because he couldn't run away from me. Hello? <laughs> he was, he was, and he wasn't, an, it, it, he wasn't an elderly person. He was a person that was in a car accident. And I walked across the street and I asked him the simple question, are you okay? Because it looked like he was struggling. And he said, you know, I just got in a car accident about two weeks ago and this is the first time I've been out of the house in two weeks. I said, oh my goodness, I didn't even know. I knew I hadn't seen him because he would get up early and go and he'd work at a hospital and, and he would come back in the evening. But, but he, when he would go, he would go early in the morning when it was dark and he said he was going across this overpass and these teenage kids had done, they were like flying the other way over the overpass and they crossed the lane. He hit him head on doing like 50 miles an hour on top of this overpass. He showed me a picture of the car and I was like, that's the car? And he's like, yeah, the engine was in the passenger seat. It was really, really bad. 
He said, thank God I was alone. He said, they told me I probably shouldn't have lived, but I'm standing here today. And I'm sitting there going, thinking, oh my goodness, opportunity. And I looked at him and I said, sir, I said, can I pray for you? I just prayed for you. And it's in that moment that sometimes we think, well, do I filter my faith or do I unleash it? Do I filter it and say, you know I mean, uh, do I filter it to the point where, well, will I offend him? Do I know he has faith? I know he doesn't have faith because he doesn't go anywhere on Sunday. He's always just, he's, he's there. So on, on weekends, his kids weekend, he's not in church. I know that his faith is not existent from conversations that I had with him. But I, then in that moment, I just said, sir, can I pray with you? And, and he said, sure. And I sat there and I prayed. I said, Lord, heal my neighbor. Lord, touch him. Thank you for saving him. Thank you for preserving his life. And he smiled, and I said amen. And from that moment on, our relationship shifted a little bit. We had a little bit deeper connection. Why? Because I made a choice. I was in a hurry, and a lot of times in life, we're in a hurry. And my, my, my goal today as a pastor is to get you to slow down a little bit and look at your neighborhood and look at who you work with and look at who, who, who God puts you in your life and slow down to a point where you see your neighbor and say, okay, I'm going to step into the awkward place so that I can see the awesome. I'm going to step into the uncomfortable place so I can see the powerful take place. Because God still uses people. We're not perfect, but he wants to use us. So, so let's pray for our neighbors. I want to encourage you right now, as I pray, I just want you to think of three people. You may not even know their name. Three people that you engage like, like you run into on a, on a regular basis, somebody that may live across the street or down the street or, or somewhere, someone that you may go through a grocery store on a regular basis and you see that person over and over and over again and you never notice their name tag, but you know them as a person, somebody you identify with. I want, I want to pray for your neighbor because I believe this. God positions us in a place that when we understand what, what, how Jesus frames what a neighbor is, we see powerful things happen. So Jesus, Lord, I pray for every person in this room that has a neighbor, Lord, that, that's in their mind right now, God, that, Lord, those three people. God, I pray, Lord, that you would use us to be the light of the world. That you would use us to make a, a difference and an impact in people around us. God, slow us down and help us to see the opportunities that, that you place in front of us. Lord, that we can make a difference in your kingdom. We love you. Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, can we thank God for what he's going to do in our neighbors? So let's talk about what, what, how Jesus framed neighbors and how he, he gave us a clear picture of what neighboring is. If you look in Luke chapter 10 with me in verse 25, it's in the YouVersion app and it's also in the church app as well if you'd like to take notes with us. Uh, on one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. He said this, teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life. Now let's, let's stop right there for a moment. An expert in law stands up and, and asks Jesus, teacher. So in those days, a teacher, a rabbi, would sit down and a pupil would stand up. The rabbi would teach, and as the rabbi taught, the pupil would stand up and would recite from the law, recite exactly what they meant in Scripture. This was a different situation. Jesus was sitting there, and he was the rabbi, and, and, and the expert in the law, the religious person, stands up, and he tests him. He questions him. And I love this because Jesus doesn't just hammer anybody. You know what I'm saying? When they ask a question, it's interesting that he asks a question back. Because he asks the question, he says, how can I inherit eternal life? And, and Jesus knows that, that this is a loaded question. This is a question that there's more behind the scenes. So he, he asks him a simple question. You ever done this with your kids? When you're interrogating your kids? When you're asking them how something got broke, you're asking them how something happened in the house, you're asking them about, about something, and, and you ask a question, and they say, good, bad, it was a mistake, just something simple. And then you start asking other questions, and you finally get a full understanding of why they were standing on the counter and jumping off the counter, or why they were doing something. You're like, wow, that gives me a bigger picture. See, Jesus asks a question because he wants to see the greater picture of what happens and, and what the guy was really after. So Jesus said, what's written in the law? How do you hear it? So in, in, in rabbinical teaching in those days, um, you're going to learn something today. Rabbinical teaching in those days, they would ask a question. The highest form of teaching was question asking. 
So they would ask a question and the, and the teacher would ask another question in order to pry that understanding and that information out of that individual. And Jesus asked a simple question, how do you see it? How, how, what, what's written in the law? How do you read it? And the religious leader in verse uh, 27 says, he answers this, he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So this guy's reciting from the old covenant. He's reciting from, from Deuteronomy where it says love God in Deuteronomy chapter 6. He's also reciting Leviticus chapter 19 where, where it says love your neighbor. But here's the tension that we have. And we have the same tension that they had back then. See what Jesus and what Jesus was given in the summation of the law was, was not just love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. How many love God? Come on clap if you love God. That's not convincing. How many love God? Come on, do you love him? Come on now. There you go. We work so hard in this box, loving God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength. Our mind, oh, we try to think certain things. Our soul, man, we try to keep our soul healthy and try to keep our soul good. Our, our, our strength and everything, we try to love God this. But Jesus wasn't saying that it's two parts. See, the religious leader thought it was two parts. He was like, yeah, you love God like that, and then you love your neighbor over here. Jesus was saying this, if you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, then the way it's demonstrated is in how you love your neighbor. When you love God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, it is natural that what flows out of it, the outflow of that love, is how you treat your neighbor. It's how it is. So, so this guy answers the question, and Jesus says this. He says, you have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this, and you will live. And the guy should have stopped right then. He should have just said, all I got to do is love the Lord my God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength, and love my neighbor as myself. But as a religious expert in the law, he wanted to know the big question. And this was the, this is what he was really getting at because he was an expert. He said, well then, who is my neighbor? You know what he was saying, really? He was saying, who deserves my love? Who do I not have to love? Who doesn't get my love? I'm going to love God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength, and I can put everything in that box. But when it comes to my neighbor, how many know sometimes loving your neighbor is complicated? Hello? Come on, how many know it's hard at times to, to love your neighbor? Why? Because they don't always respond well to love. They don't respond well to, to greetings. They don't respond well. And the reason why sometimes our neighbors don't respond all the way, all the time the way we want them to is because their life is complicated. Their life is painful. Their life has different levels and different things that, that they're going through. But, but he says, how in the world, who is my neighbor? So if he's trying to figure out who's, who's my neighbor, Jesus looks at him and he tells, he tells a story. When he tells a story, um, Jesus is a great storyteller. If you look in, Bible, in the Bible, when he starts telling different parables and different things, he always looks at, at, he always pulls out different characters and different things that people are doing. And in those times when they would tell a story, there would always be, there were like the villain was there, and then there were these characters that were there, but then there was always a hero. How many like the hero in every story? Come on now, do you like the hero? Come on, I believe the hero is, is the veteran, the veteran that we don't know where they served, we don't know how they served, and some of them still deal with the fact that they did serve because it's on their lives and it's in their lives. But the hero is that person and that person, it, it actually interjects with our story in a big way. But when Jesus tells a story, he, he tells a story that, that really jacks them up. He really messes with them in a, in a huge way. And this ought, to, this ought to challenge us because of what he was trying to get to in the bottom line of, of just loving your neighbor. Look in verse 30. Jesus replied to the man, and he tells the story. He says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to, Je to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who, were, who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving, from, leaving him for dead. So this guy's going from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he's traveling down this road. Now, it's not just a road that you travel down. It's a path that's steep. It's a hill that you, you go down, and, and when you go from Jerusalem to Jericho, it winds. It has all these things. It has cliffs and everything. It's got caves, and it's got perfect places for thieves and robbers to stage themselves. So when somebody comes by, boom, they pounce on them, and they mess them up. So this is a situation. This guy's traveling, and he gets beaten. He gets stripped. 
and he gets left for dead. But by chance, Jesus is telling the story, he says, by chance, a priest who was going down that road, when he saw him, he did what? He passed by on the other side. See, what we've got to understand is that the priest, he was serving in the temple in Jerusalem, the, the temples in Jerusalem. So he was on his way back home to Jericho. And he would travel to Jerusalem, do his duties, uh, operate in, in, in the temple and everything, and then he would travel back. But in the process of traveling back, he sees something, and when he sees something, he has to make a calculated decision. His reason for acting is not just based on what he sees. His reason is so complicated because as a priest, when he comes by, here's what happens. If he would have walked over and touched the individual and dealt with the situation, he would be declared unclean. So he would have to go back to Jerusalem. He would have to go through this purification, right? He would have to go through this whole process in order to return home. He wouldn't be able to return home for another seven days. Why? Because he, he dealt with something that, that brought an uncleanness. So his decision, his reason is complicated. His reason is, is if I do this, then I'm not going to be able to serve. If I do this, then I'm not going to be able to, to do what I need. So he sees the man and he walks on the other side. He chose not to help. He leaves a man half naked on the side of the road to fend for himself and keeps going down the road. See, whatever, whenever there's a reason, whenever there's an opportunity to help somebody, to help somebody in need, there's always going to be a reason why we should not, why we could not, and why we did not. Because all of us face that at times where, where there's opportunities that, that things can happen, but we're either too busy, we're either too, we've got too many things going on in our life, or we're like, I don't have the resource or the energy to deal with that situation. And God wants us to encourage us that, that we can either live like the priest and bypass those around us that are in our, that are in our neighborhood. We can live in this, this bubble of, okay, this is my neighborhood, this is where I live, and bypass everybody around us. Or we can live in that neighborhood and realize, God put me here. If he put me here, he put me here for a reason. Somebody needs to be, somebody needs to be impacted with the gospel. Somebody needs to hear about the kingdom. I'm not here by chance. How many know that you're not here by chance? Come on. So you've got to realize that, that if we truly love and honor God and, and, and understand who he is, then loving our neighbor is complicated. Loving our neighbors is going to have layers to it that, that we've got to decide in advance that there's not a reason too, too great to keep me from what? from slowing down and building a relationship so that I can, I can bring them into the kingdom. Jesus didn't save me just so that I can feel good. Jesus didn't, didn't say, I'm going to exit this earth and send the power of the Holy Spirit so that you can be a witness, just so that I can feel powerful. He puts his power inside of us so we can change the whole world. Let's frame it this way. Lean in. Jesus died for everyone. If you live in the South, he died for everyone. You know what I'm saying? He died for the whole world. So if he died for the whole world and he lives in me, if all I do is keep what he's put inside of me, then I may end up being like the priest. The priest is the one person that is paid to do what he does. He's the one that you would expect. Wait a minute. He's the pastor. He's the professional. He should stop. He should pray. He should take care of the situation. But the priest chose to walk on the other side of the road. Then in verse 32, it says, so likewise, Jesus is telling the story. The priest goes by, then, the, then a Levite, when he came to the place, he saw him, and he passed by on the other side. You've got to realize that the Levite is the person that serves the priest in the temple. So if the Levite is a, is a person that, that works for the temple, but he works directly for the priest, and if he lives in Jericho, then he knows who's in front of him. He knows who left before him. Why? Because when the priest is done, sometimes he goes, peace out. And it's the person that's the Levite that's got to take care of all the details and clean up all the mess and get it ready for the next week. So he's like going out. He's like, he went ahead of me. I know he lives there because I live there. And what does he do? He makes a calculated decision based on an excuse. His excuse might be, well, the priest has already walked by. The priest has already looked at the situation. The priest, if I bring this guy into Jericho, if I pick him up and bring him into Jericho, then I've got to deal with my boss. 
I've got to deal with the guy that, that, that already decided in advance. So my excuse is simple. I'm too busy. I'm, I, just, I just don't have time. And sometimes we live like the Levite. We're too busy. We don't have time. Or I don't know the person. I don't even, I don't, I don't want to be uncomfortable. Or, or better yet, I make it dirty. It may cost me to, to get my hands dirty a little bit in order to do what? In order to help somebody. Or the biggest one, it may be excuses. Man, I'm on my way somewhere. And if I'm on my way somewhere, maybe I don't have time to stop somewhere in order to help somebody get somewhere. See, this guy, he saw the man and he walked by on the other side. He chose not to help. And then Jesus continues the story. And everybody that's listening in, in the room, everybody that's, that's listening to Jesus is on the edge of the seat because he just called out the priest for walking by. And he just called out the Levite. And every single one of them think in their heart of hearts that the next person that comes on the scene that Jesus is gonna write into the story and tell them is the Jewish man that loves God and, and, and worships in the temple. But Jesus flips it. He flips it around and he says this. Look at what he says. He says in verse 33, but it said, at first he says, you know, just by chance a priest comes by. And then a Levite comes by. And you saw their response. They did what? They walked on the other side. They walked away from, they didn't deal with it. But then he says, but a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion on him. The thing we've got to realize is that Jews and Samaritans didn't, didn't actually do life together. They didn't actually live in the same neighborhood. The Jews, and the, the Jews and, the, and the Samaritans, the Jews referred the Samaritans as half-breeds. There was complete racial unrest and tension between the Jews and the Samaritans. The Samaritans didn't, didn't, didn't like operate around the Jews. And the Jews, if you were traveling from Galilee to Jerusalem, and Samaria is like right in the middle, in order to avoid that part of town, they would drive two miles around that part of town. They would walk two miles around because they didn't want to go through that part of town. Why? Because they knew who lived there. They knew who was there. So they framed it in a way, and this ought to make us uncomfortable. Jesus is taking their enemy, and he's painting a picture that he is the hero in the story. And the people that are religious are on the edge of their seat going, I cannot believe that you are writing, you are saying this. And then he does the most amazing thing. He continues on. He said, he says, there's what the Samaritan did. He went to him. He bound up his wounds, pouring oil on his wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn to take care of him. The Samaritan picks up the naked guy that's beat up, puts him on his donkey, and walks the rest of the way to the next city, and walks to an inn, and takes him to that place. You know how awkward it would be for a Samaritan to walk into a Jewish territory with a half-naked man that's been beat up, and walk in and bring him to an inn, and then go to the innkeeper and say, Here's the deal. I'm leaving, but here's two days wages. I want you to take care of him. I want the best for him. And when I come back, you know what he was saying? I'm coming back. The enemy was coming back. He was coming back and he was like, I'm going to pay for everything that this man needs. Why? Because that's what love does. So he, he takes care of him, puts it on his own animal. If you look down, you see the Samaritan, he saw the man and here's what he did. He didn't just notice him. He crossed the street. And when he crossed the street, he reached down and he picked him up. And he encouraged him and he bound him. He put, he put bandages on him, poured oil and wine on it, and he took care of him. He was the one that showed compassion on him. See, the Samaritans step into the awkward just to see something awesome. And Jesus uses an enemy as, as what they would frame as the hero to show us today that, that there are people in this world that walk by us, that are around us, that work with us, that just need to hear someone bring some compassion, someone bring some mercy, someone to just do this, to stop for a moment and simply care. If we would just be the church that doesn't just do church, but lives the church, but it's the church outside the wall, we would start seeing people taken care of. We would start realizing that, wait a minute, they're my neighbor. So Jesus, after, after, this, after he tells this thing, he says, and the next day he takes out the two denarii. But in verse 36, he says to the, to the religious man, he says, 
Which of these three do you think proved? Everyone say proved. If you look in the Gospels, that, that in certain translations, that word proved is dropped out. But if you look in the original language, it's there. And that word proved means demonstrate. He says, which one demonstrated? Which one proved? Which one showed exactly who, who, the, who was the neighbor to the man that fell among the robbers? And the, and, and the religious guy that's standing up in front of everybody, tests everybody, he has no choice but to say, uh, the one, he doesn't say the Samaritan, he doesn't say who he is, he says the one, who what? Who showed mercy. And Jesus says what? He says, go and do likewise. Jesus encourages him. He says, go and do likewise. He says, go and be like the Samaritan. See, the Samaritan proved. Remember that passage of scripture in Romans where, 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 where Paul says this, that God demonstrated his love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us? God's demonstration of love was the cross. If love is going to be real, if love is going to be realized, if we're going to love our neighbor, then we've got to realize that it has to be proved and it has to be genuine. If we don't do anything about it, if we don't act on it, in James it says faith without works is dead. <laughs> so if I say that I have faith, but I don't do anything with it, then I've got to realize that my faith is, oops, dead. See, my faith, see, sometimes we, we frame it this way. My faith is, is Lord, I want to love you with my my mind, soul, and strength, everything that I have, that's what I do. I focus on this. I concentrate on this. Now, I run into people, not, not in this church, okay? I just want to frame it in the right way because I've traveled a lot of different places and, and over the years. And, and, and I was traveling through a church one time, this, this, this precious saint, and I say precious in a, in, a, in a sarcastic way. This precious saint said to me, she said, Pastor, she goes, after I preach, ah, I just, you know, and I'm like, I'm like, yes, ma'am. She goes, she goes um, I just want to leave this church. And I was like, what? Are you kidding me? And I thought, this is a great place. Why would you do that? She goes, I just want to be fed. And I'm like, you want to be what? She goes, I just want to be fed. I just want to sit and listen and, and hear and be fed. And, and I just need to be fed. If all we do is feed our spiritual, I want to love the Lord my God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength, we fail to remember that when we love him, the outflow is loving our neighbor. It has to go out here. It has to be here. What a greater reason than to pull out my phone and text $25 to thanksg with Thanksgiving in the key word. Why? Because I'm putting my faith on display. I'm demonstrating this thing called L-O-B-E. Because if love's going to be real, if the church is going to be the church, and the church has to demonstrate its love. That's why two weeks ago, we, we handed out a thousand hot dogs. Man, I thank God for a hundred plus people that showed up and worked with, with, with games and inflatable things and, and picked up trash and set up stuff and, and sang and did all different things in the parking lot. Why? To communicate to our community. Why? We love you. That's what the church does. Why? That's our mission. How many believe that's your mission? So it has to be real. So what are you saying, Pastor? What I'm saying is this, is that the main idea to this, 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 this beautiful message is this, and I pray, man, I pray that you get uncomfortable. I pray that it becomes awkward tomorrow for you. I pray that, that there's a moment that you realize that something shifts and the light turns on and you realize that God's got purpose set aside for me. God's got a destiny for me. It doesn't matter how old I am or how young I am. God can simply use me. Why? Because Loving my neighbor is simply a step of faith. It's a step of faith. For me to walk across the street in that, in that neighborhood, to walk across and to engage with my neighbor that's in a walker and say, how are you doing? Are you okay? He's not okay. Oh, okay? He's struggling. He's, he's like hopped up on drugs going, ah, and I'm like, are you going to fall over? You know what I'm saying? And then when the whole story comes out, there's a part of my faith that says, I'm going to love you and, and I'm going to encourage you in this moment. So loving my neighbor is a step of faith. So what steps can I take? What can I do to love my neighbor? I want to help you out. Look at your neighbor and say, Pastor's going to help you out. Come on, do that again. Say, Pastor's going to help you out. <laughs> See, here's what you need to do, you know. This week, when you're going through life, just simply frame it in this way. First thing I think you can do is just, just, just cross the street and get to know your neighbor. Just cross past, path, just cross past the, the knowing them on the surface. 
Sometimes we know people on the surface. We see people on the surface. We see them walk by in our neighborhood. We see them walk by in, in, in a grocery store. Some of us are creatures of habit. We go to the grocery store. We see that girl that stands behind the counter every week, and we ring it, and she's got a name tag. You know something? She has a name. So why don't you cross the street a little bit? I have two dogs. You know something? Two dogs. It's amazing. I can walk my dogs in my neighborhood, and people are like, ooh, look at those French bulldogs. You know what I'm saying? And they want to come up and walk up to them. It's not always the best thing, especially if they have a dog because they're like holding them and I'm holding them and they're trying to meet in the middle. You know what it is? It's called an opportunity. It's an opportunity to get to know them. Hey, what's your name? My name is this. Hey, what's going on? Man, I grill in my driveway. I grill like food and smoke. I have a smoker. I'll bring it out and it'll smoke. And people will walk by and I'm out there with my smoker and they're like, not smoking, but smoker. You know what I'm saying? I'm like smoking brisket or something. And they're just like, oh, that smells good. Hey, how you doing? You know what I'm saying? It's called a an opportunity. Why? Because I choose to realize that if I don't cross the street, then maybe they may never hear. If I don't step out of my comfort zone, then maybe they won't hear the gospel. Somebody in your world is waiting for you. Let me say that again. Somebody in your world is just simply waiting for you to say, hey, what's your name? And get beyond the surface. Cross the street. Take a risk. Here's what you got to understand. They're not always going to respond in the greatest of ways. They're not always gonna appreciate the fact that you cross the street, but, but keep crossing the street. Man, I have a neighbor that, that lives next to me. You ever, you know, I'm bad with names. Anybody bad with names? Please don't be offended if pastor calls you the wrong name over and over and over again. There's a gentleman in our church, I called him the wrong name for three months, and then at the end of three months, he told me his name, and I'm like, are you kidding me? You didn't correct me? He goes, oh, that's funny, Pastor. <laughs> and I was like, oh, I feel good. You know what I'm saying? I am not Pastor Barney. I am not Mr. Rogers. He knows everybody's name. He's got the gift on the planet. Can you give it up for Pastor Barney? He's just got a... Man, I desire that. I want that. But when I meet my neighbors, here's what, I, here's what I do. I don't know if you're me, but this is the way I When I meet my neighbors and I get their name, you know what I do? I pull up my phone when they don't see me and I write their name in. Why? Because three minutes later, it may fall out of my head. Hello? So I really want to be able to, the next time I go up to them and say, hey, how are you? And then be able to say their name. You know what I'm saying? Just be able to, and I try to do word association games with you. It's okay. So that I can actually remember who you are. And, and if I struggle with it, just, just, just feel my pain, okay? But what I'm saying is this. If they know, if they have a name, everybody wants to, wants, wants to hear their name. When you go to the grocery store, learn that person's name. And then when you get in line and you look around and you see that her line is longer, wait. Wait in that line. Be a little bit more intentional. Wait in that line. Wait so that you can just, you can continue the conversation. You know, they like to talk about what you're eating. Oh, that looks good. Oh, I can't believe this. We go to Trader Joe's sometimes. They're like, oh, I want to try that. You know, oh, that's amazing. Isn't it good? Oh, it's, you know, you just start talking about food. Everyone loves food. How many loves food? You love to live. Don't you love food? So, so cross the street. Second thing you can do, and Pastor Steve, your team can come. Um, you can say hello, neighbor, by simply just start looking at your neighbor as an opportunity and not a liability. Sometimes you look at our neighbors and we're like, my goodness. I can't believe I have to live next door to that. I just wish somebody would come and fix that. I wish that somebody, I mean, I, I, I'm in a, a homeowners association and, and it's interesting to see the people that post on this, this app thing that it's, it's in this area and they like complain about everything under the sun over and over about the people that live next to them and around them and, and because of their yard or because of their garbage or because of the, the poop, you know, they're like, like talking, I mean, they're like talking about the nitty gritty things that change the world, you know, like garbage and poop, okay? So, so I'm like, this is amazing. No, it's not. When it comes to our neighbors, we got to look at them and say, hey, nobody's perfect. Hello, I'm not perfect, but God's placed me here. So if I start looking at them not a liability, I start looking at them as an opportunity, then that's going to change my posture. Then I can stop looking at the cost and start seeing the investment. I can stop looking at the time and start looking for his time. Remember that the story I told you about the gentleman? It was not my time to go across the street. I didn't have the time to go across the street. Sometimes that's the reason or the excuse that we use, but sometimes God puts us in a position where we're right in front of somebody and it's his time. And when it's his time, we've got to say, okay, God, I can't look at this as a liability. I can't look at it like this is messing up my time. I can't look at it like this. I got to look at it like, God, okay, this is maybe your time. This may be your time to reach this person. 
This may be your time to shift the relationship with this person. Simply because I'm able to, to just be intentional about building the relationship. I talked to a gentleman and, and his wife recently that are in our church and, and um, um, when you take care of retired parents and you try to keep them busy at times, sometimes you do things that are just like crazy. Like, like this lady takes her mom out all day long on a certain day of the week. And they just go from this store to that store to the bank. They do the same thing every single day. And they were telling me that, that, that when they go into the bank, they know her name. When they go into the store, they know her name. When they go to the grocery store, they know her name. They know everything about them. When they go to eat at this place, they know their name. Why? Because they're creatures of habit. Here's the beautiful thing. One of them is, goes to a Spanish church. The other one comes to this church. And the mom will say, hey, that lady's English. You ought to give her your invite. And, and she's like, I got my invite. She's a Spanish person. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to invite her. You know something? They're intentional about seeing the person. They start getting to know their names. They're like, everybody, everybody knows who we are. And then they start asking where mom is and different things like that. Be intentional about your relationships. Like I said, when you, when you go, like, like some of us go to coffee shops. Some of us go to donut shops. Hello? Come on now. There's heaven on earth in there. Hello? You're there for a purpose. You're like, yeah, but, but the more you go, the more you realize, wait a minute, it's the same person waiting on me. It's not just a person waiting on me. It's a soul. And if it's a soul and I get to run into them on a regular basis, then there's going to be a moment if I start being intentional about it. And there's going to be a moment where the relationship grows, where I can actually hold out a card and I can say, hey, this is where it gets awkward. I'm going to step into the awkward because I want the awesome for them. And I just say, hey, will you sit with me on Sunday? Why? Because I am a familiar face that you see all the time. I am building a relationship with you because I want to see you in heaven. I am reaching out to you. Why? In the right opportunity. And sometimes we don't know when that is, but when God shows up, hello, it might be that person that's just struggling with life and trying to make it in life. And he puts you in their path to speak life. See, here's the greatest thing you can do with your faith. This ought to make you real uncomfortable. Um, live out your faith. Don't filter it. Society wants you to filter your faith. Society wants you to pick, take your Christianity and take your faith and keep it in your house and keep it in your church and don't take it to the community. Because if you do, society says you're going to offend somebody because of your, your faith. I'm here to tell you, everybody's offended, so get over it, okay? I love Jesus. He's the only way. He's the truth. He's the life. If he placed me in this place, guess what? I'm here for a reason. Get over it. What does that mean? Live out my faith. Oh, that means activate it. That may mean ask good questions. When you get in a relationship with somebody, ask them the simple question in your line. Hey, what church do you go to? Oh, that's a simple question. And sometimes they'll go, because uh, they're, they don't, they're, they're, and like, hey, it's okay. You know, you can come with me. Sometimes they don't know. They have never been. Think of this. Some of the most unreached people on the planet do not live in India and do not live in Africa. They live in Florida. They live in Jacksonville. They were raised by people that never went to church. They were raised by people that don't even, don't even have a, a, an idea of what church is. But the moment that we're real, the moment that we say, okay, God, we're just going to let our faith be real. And the moment that you realize, and, that, and that they build that relationship, and that person just says, they turn around and say, man, will you pray for me? My life is a mess. You can go, okay, I'll pray for you and walk away. Or you can say, Jesus, <laughs> in your holy name, work this thing out. What you're doing is you're opening up an opportunity for God to show up in the midst of it. You're living out your faith. You're putting your faith on display. You're demonstrating what love is, but you know what it is? It's a step of faith. Because, listen, I can't control the situation, but I can take a step. I can't control their response, but I can keep taking a step. They may not like the response. There's a, there's, there's a gentleman in our neighborhood that I've talked to over and over and over again and just kind of connected with, and, and I called him the wrong name by accident, <laughs> my mistake, you know what I'm saying? And he like snapped back at me one time, and I went, oh my goodness. But here's the deal. If I don't see him for two or three weeks, my wife says, 
go knock on his door and make sure everything's okay because he lives all by himself. And I'll knock on his door and I'll say, hey, how are you doing? Is everything okay? And he'll say, you know, I just went through some more treatments. And I'll go, how's that going? And he'll tell me, he'll just, and he, he, I don't go in his house. He doesn't want me to go in his house. And I'll say, hey, can I pray with you? And now he'll drive out. He'll stop at my driveway if he's driving his car and stop and say, hey, pastor, how are you doing? And I'll say, hey, how's life? You know what it does? I'm living my faith out. Has he come to know Christ? Not yet. But you know something? I'm believing and I'm praying and I'm going to keep crossing the street. I'm going to keep looking for the opportunity. I'm going to keep living out my faith in front of him. I'm going to keep going. Sometimes we want to see the end result and we don't realize it's an investment. It's an investment. It takes time. Relationship is something we work on. Jesus said this. He said, who do you say, who would you say proved to be a neighbor, the one who showed mercy. So why don't we be the church that shows mercy to the people around us, that reaches out and loves the people around us, that, that reaches out. See, the hero in the story is just simply a guy that walked by a situation and crossed the street. Simply a person. We don't have his name. We just know his ethnicity. We just know that he was a Samaritan. But he chose to walk across and pick up a man and take care of him. And Jesus looks at him, he flips the script and says, hey, the enemy is the hero because he's the one that showed mercy. So let's pray together. Father, we love you. God, I thank you. Lord, I thank you that the greatest way that we can love you is simply by loving our neighbors. God, simply by putting our love on display, by demonstrating it to the people around us. God, I pray for, for us in this room. Now, now think while I'm praying of those names or those people that you uh, thought about at the beginning of the service. Think about who they are. Father, I pray, Lord, this week, this month, this year, we would cross the street. I pray, God, that we would look for the opportunity and not the liability. God, I pray, Lord, that you would help us to live out our faith and not filter it, God. Be the, be the church, Jesus, that's alive and moving and active in every possible way. Jesus, you came for everybody. And if you came for everybody, you planted us here, Jesus, to make a difference in our neighbors. As we're praying this morning, you might say, Pastor, I am that person. I am that neighbor. I am that one that that just needs to experience mercy, that just needs to, to know that he loves me. I'm away from him. I need to know him. There's something in this service today that says something's missing in my life and something's pulling at my heart saying, I need something more. What you're, what you're experiencing is the Holy Spirit drawing you and saying there is more for you and his name is Jesus and all you have to do is simply believe. He's not asking you to change yourself. He's not asking you to fix yourself. He's not asking you to clean yourself up. He's saying simply believe and in the process and the journey of believing, that's when real life change happens. That's when his power starts moving in your life. So if you're here today and you say, Pastor, pray for me in this moment. Pray that, pray for my soul. I do want to know Jesus. This moment is my moment to give my life to him. If you're online, there'll be somebody that'll give you something to respond. But if you're in this room, when I say three, would you wave at me? And that's our connection point. Would you wave at me and say, Pastor, what you're saying is, Pastor, pray for me. Please pray for me. I want to give my life to Jesus today. I want to make a decision for heaven today. I want Jesus in my life. That's you when I say three, wave at me. Ready? One, all across the building. Two, Looking around, three, wave at me. Nobody's looking. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, sir. Thank you. One more minute. Anyone else? Just hold it open just for a minute. Man, God's here. Don't miss it. He's here. Thank you. And God's good. If you lifted your hand and God's moving in your heart, it's simple. Would you pray a prayer with me? It sounds like this, in your heart say this, Jesus, today I believe you died for me. Today I believe that you have a plan for me. So today, Jesus, I'm giving my life to you. I'm giving my life back to you. From this point on, I choose to live for you. Make my life what you want it to be, in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, can we celebrate? Oh, that's good. You can do better than that. Come on, somebody just gave their heart to Jesus. 
All of heaven is rejoicing right now. Now I want to encourage you in your in your um, in the seats in front of you. There's a great card that says "My Decision." You know, giving your life to Christ is the first step. Your next step, simple step, is to take this card and fill it out, and either drop it in the back or bring it to me because we're going to sing here in a moment and I'll stand here and, and pray with you but I would encourage you that your next step is the step that we choose to take with you we want to do this journey with you we believe that God's got a plan for you he's got more than you can ever imagine and we want to walk out that journey with you maybe you're here today and you're like pastor I know that man God moved in the middle of service there were some powerful moments but I still need prayer we're going to worship him here's why we're going to worship him we're going to worship him because in, 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 the, in the process of worshiping him, just for a moment before we leave, in the process, what we're saying is, God, I love you. And this week, I'm going to look to love those three people. God, I love you. Pastor, why'd you pick three? The reason why I picked three is because we can't change the world, but we can focus on three. For some of us in the room, God, man, that's a whole lot. I want to encourage you, pick one. Pick one this week. Start praying. God, I pray for that person. I pray for that person. Put yourself in the awkward so that you can see the awesome take place. Put yourself in the uncomfortable place. You're like, Pastor, that's not something I want to do. That's not something I feel good doing. That's not something I don't know how to do. But I'm going to do it. Why? Because it's a step of faith. If I want my faith to grow, if I want my love to grow, then it's got to be funneled and demonstrated to the people around me. So as we worship, just for, just for a moment longer, as we worship, what we're saying is, God, I love you. Use me to love the world. God, I love you. Use me to love my neighbor. Somebody is going to be changing somebody's tire, mowing somebody's yard, bringing some brownies to somebody in your neighborhood. Somebody's going to be encouraged and to look at your neighbor. You're going to drive by your neighbor's house and you're going to start praying, God, every house in my neighborhood, every house in my neighborhood, every home by I drive by, every apartment I live near, God, I just pray that you would save them, save them, save them, save them. Use me. If it's me, I'm available. So can we stand to our feet today? Can we just lift our hands today? Can we just worship him and, and just invite him to put more love in us that we can love those around us? If you filled out a card or made a decision, I'm going to stand here. If you need prayer, we'll stand right here and we'll pray with you. Let's worship him this morning. Thanks for watching. If you'd like to support this ministry, you can check us out at OceanWayAG.com and click the gift tab. For the black.